Hey guys, this is Dawson Discussions. Um, my name is Nathan L. Dawson Jr. Today's date is May 12th, 2021. In this video, I will be reviewing this book. The Young Entrepreneur's Guide to Starting and Running a Business, Turn Your Ideas into Money by Steve Mariotti and Deborah DeSavo, released in April 2014. So, here we go. So a little bit about the authors. Um, Steve Mariotti is a prominent advocate for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship education worldwide. He is the founder and former president of the Global Nonprofit Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, NFTE, or probably pronounced NIFTY, and author of several books, textbooks, and articles exploring the, transpor the trans- formative um, power of entrepreneurship for low-income communities. In 1982, Steve Mariotti left his successful business career to serve as a special ed teacher in some of the city's most poorest and most notorious neighborhoods. Frustrated at first by his rowdy classrooms, Steve Mariotti discovered he could motivate even his most challenging students by teaching them how to run a small business. This experience inspired him to found the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, today known as NFTE, or probably pronounced NIFTY, with the mission to empower at-risk youth and creating pathways out of poverty. Steve Mariotti um, founded NIFTY on his public high school a teacher salary in 1987. Um, he went on to lead teams that raised more than $150 million for NIFTY's mission over 26 years and built NIFTY into the leading global provider of entrepreneurship education for low-income youth from Chicago all the way to China. Today, NIFTY operates in 23 locations in 10 countries and has served nearly 1 million young people. And the co-author is Deborah DeSalvo. Um, I don't really um, know a whole lot about her, at least uh, from researching her, but all I can actually say about her is just that she's a writer, having contributed to um, articles for Investors Daily, Barron's Magazines, and New York Business, and probably among others. And this is my review. So essentially, entrepreneurship is the process of starting and managing a business entity that provides innovation and value to the market, while all at the same time mitigating the risk associated with managing that business in pursuit of a profit. And of course, the people who create these businesses are often referred to as entrepreneurs. So essentially, um, I really do like this book in particular. Uh, because uh, the book is very clearly written and explains everything so well with a glossary at the back. Um, it also have a it also have the high school textbook format rather than your typical novel format uh, when you read it, which I appreciate uh, personally myself because since most books I've read in the past were actually in textbook format, aside from you know novels from my um, English language arts class that my English language arts teachers uh, told me to you know do a book report on or you know like that. Um, essentially, this book itself it's um, only five hundred pages with uh, seven parts. So part one talks about creating your business, your cre creating your business. Part two is connecting with your customers. Part three is managing your money. Part four is protecting your business. Part five is growing your business. Part six is to harvest your business, which is um, your exit plan. And part seven is writing a um, winning business plan. And of course, with those seven parts, there are 22 chapters total. Um, for example, um, just to um, not give out all the chapters, but uh, I'm just giving out a list of these um, chapters, for example. Um, it's um, how entrepreneurship helps the economy, choose the right legal formation, you know, if you want to go corporate, like C-Corp, S-Corp, or a LLC. Um, how to finance your business, how to do market research, how to sell, how to negotiate, using financial statements, you know, like your income and expense statements or your profit and loss statement, your cash flow statement and your balance sheet, which is like your assets and your liabilities, uh, how to bookkeep, how to safeguard your intellectual property. And your intellectual property is property that includes intangible creations of the human intellects. You might know them as patents, uh, your copyrights, trademarks, branding, goodwills, and etc. Also, another chapter is um, business insurance, um, taxes, hiring, uh, growth strategies and your exit strategies again which your exit strategies which is also known as um, again in this book as um, harvesting your uh, business um, not only that um, 
this book also gives um, real life examples of entrepreneurship, like Ben and Jerry's. You know, Ben and Jerry's has the um, ice cream uh, company, and also Honesty, which is I think another. It's a beverage company, but I think they um, specialize in making tea. And of course, the Twenty Three and Me DNA testing company. But the rest of the businesses um, in this book for real life examples. Um, I haven't really heard of them because, again, they're small, but they also um, listed um, examples on their stories on entrepreneurship and then actually how they ventured into um, entrepreneurship. Also, um, a self-employed person does not really work for a specific employer that pays them a consistent salary or wage. So self-employed individuals or independent contractors earn income by contracting with a trade or a business directly in a um, well, a self-employed person refers to any person who earns their living from any independent pursuit of economic activity as opposed to earning a living working for a company or another in- individual, which is the employer. So a freelancer or an independent contractor who performs all of their work for a single client may still be a self-employed person. Self-employment provides work primarily for the founders. Also, um, a synonym for self-employed would probably be sole proprietorship, which is a type of enterprise owned and run by one person, in which there is no legal distinction between the owner and the business entity. A sole trader does not necessarily work alone. It is possible for the sole trader to employ other people. So, um, the sole trader receives all profits uh, subject to taxation specific to the business and have unlimited responsibility for all losses and debts. Every asset of the business is owned by the proprietor and all debts of the business are the proprietors. It is a sole proprietorship in contrast with partnerships because partnerships must have at least two owners. So essentially a self-employed person is not necessarily the same thing as being a business owner because the owner of a business, for instance, may hire employees and essentially become the boss and employee owner who operates and manages the business. Alternatively, a business owner have an ownership stake but may not be involved in the day-to-day operations of the company. In contrast, a person who is self-employed both owns the business and... um, is also the primary or sole operator. But the taxation rules that apply to those who are um, self-employed differ from the employee or a business owner. Um, so essentially overall, um, this book, uh, yeah, um, this book overall is a pretty good book, especially for those um, who are young who actually want to um, venture into um, entrepreneurship. So essentially the reason why I primarily bought this book was because actually um, I'm actually in the beginning phase of starting my own business. Um, one of the people who actually inspired me to actually start my own business, which of course you know led me to buy that to buy this book, was actually Malcolm X. Um, in his in his most famous speech, um, the Battle of the Bullet speech. April 3rd, 1964, he said, the economic philosophy of black nationalism is pure and simple. It only means that we should control the economy of our community. The philosophy of black nationalism involves a re-education program and a black community in regards to economics. Our people have been, our people have to be made to see that um, anytime you take the dollar out of your community and spend it in a community where you don't live, the community where you live will get poorer and poorer, and the community where you spend your money will get richer and richer. The economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we should own and operate and control the economy of our community. The economic philosophy of black nationalism shows our people the importance of setting up these little stores and developing them and expanding them into large operations. So our people not only have to be re-educated to the importance of supporting black businesses, but the black man himself has to be made aware of the importance of going into business. And once you are not going into business, we own and operate at least the businesses in our community. What we will be doing is developing a situation wherein we will actually be able to create employment for the people in our in the community. If we own the stores, if we, own, if we operate the businesses, if we try to establish some industry in our own community, then we're developing the position where we are creating employment for our own kind. Again, quoting uh, Malcolm X, the Battle of the Bullet speech, April 3rd, 1964. 
You know, so um, essentially entrepreneurship or starting a business or becoming a business owner has often been um, heralded as a way to reduce the U.S. Uh, racial wealth gap between black people and white people. So, however, um, our attempts at entrepreneurship and by our, I mean, um, African-Americans or black people um, in general in the United States uh, have often been foiled by the lack of financial capital and ability inability to obtain financing, especially through government programs. So there were 2.6 million um, black-owned businesses uh, nationally in 2012, which was up from 1.9 million or 34.5% from 2007. Of course, there was like uh, many apps and online directories such as the Fisher Black Wall Street or the Now List um, that have emerged offering a database of African-American-owned businesses that um, consumers can support. So, of course, as of the recent months in 2021, uh, it's kind of approximated because it's kind of hard to um, find an actual index on the status of black businesses. But essentially, uh, black people, we we represent about 15% of the U.S. population, but we only own and operate 4.3% of the nation's 22.2 million uh, businesses. Essentially, what that tells me that 95.7% of businesses are owned by non-blacks. Not to mention that COVID-19 um, is also having a, dispar- a disproportionate economic impact on African-American families. Um, African-American small businesses have been hit hard and over 90% of African-American owned businesses are estimated to, or were estimated um, to be shut out of the initial relief program due to the pre-existing systematic dis- disparities in lending. This is especially um, dire given that African American families have less of a financial cushion to fall back on to fall back on in hard times as compared to our white counterparts and our Asian counterparts. So this was recently evident when black owned small businesses were primarily and largely shut out of financing from the SBA's SBA's um payroll protection program or the PPP loan. So essentially black owned businesses start with approximately a third less capital than their white peers and Asian peers, as um, difficult, difficulties raising private investments from mainstream investment systems. Only 1% of black business owners obtain loans in their founding year, compared to 7% of white business owners. So African-American businesses are rejected at a rate nearly 20% higher than that of white-owned firms and Asian-owned firms. Even worse, black-owned businesses that do get funding receive only 40% of the funds requested as compared to 70% for um, white biz- white-owned businesses. And of course, black-owned firm applications rates uh, for new funding are 10 percentage points higher than white-owned uh, firms but their approval rates are 90% points lower, and 40% of non-applicant black-owned firms did not apply for financing because they were um, discouraged. They did not think that they would be approved compared to, compared with 40% of white-owned firms. And of course, um, black-owned businesses also saw the most significant growth in shares of firms that went from breaking even or operating at a loss to making a profit between the year 2016 and the year 2018. And 60% of black owned businesses expected to increase employee headcount in the next year compared to 43% of white owned firms. You know, so many um, black people are really frustrated. You know, we always keep saying, uh, you know, black lives matter, support black businesses, you know, bank black, but none of us are really saying it's by blacks and for blacks, but instead we actually keep voting for these benign neglect politicians and hope that they will give us empowerment instead of practicing ethno ethno aggregation as stated by Dr. Claude Anderson and lobbying politicians that will not use the benign neglect against us so we can actually become more competitive in the United States of America. So whenever black people talk of economic or financial empowerment, certain people usually like to come at us at a microaggressive way, saying that we are being discriminatory against white people, especially from especially from the political right wing, um, white people in general. But isn't that black people picking ourselves up by the bootstraps instead of pushing for reparations that the right wing would want us to do? So essentially, um, we have a annual um, spending power of at least $1 trillion. So imagine if the 
1.5 trillion dollars of black mining power i guess i'm approximated this year because over the years it's been growing steady steadily imagine if that 1.5 trillion dollars of black mining power is retained and black people let the money circulate in our neighborhoods meaning we uh, black people buy from black owned businesses primarily and we take that money and then we're going to invest that money into our neighborhoods and our well-being so um once you imagine that, what would the economic state of black America would look like within a decade or two decades or even three decades? How rich or wealthy would the black community would be within 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? Essentially, this is us picking ourselves up by the bootstraps that the right wing would want black people to do this is us using free market laissez-faire capitalism in a creative way to economically empower ourselves i mean the political right wing um, do not want to give us reparations from because of slavery or jim crow or at least an economic empowerment plan executive order similar to what um former president donald trump a right wing republican capitalist mind you signed for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community in May 2019. That executive order I am referring to is Presidential Executive Order 13872. Or to pass a congressional legislation for an economic empowerment plan for the non for the native non Hispanic black American. If they really want us to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps, then we must practice ethno aggregation, just like the Jewish American community do, the Asian American community do, and these um, recent immigrant communities um, do, and connect and conduct group economics to control the economy of our black community, just as Dr. Claude Anderson and Malcolm X had intended. Because the first generation of ethnic immigrants typically build their own independent communities before assimilating into the larger society during the second generation. They retain their ethnic communities as social economic um, alternatives. A second generation Chinese, Arab, or Hispanic person can always go back to his ethnic community if he feels rejected by other whites. Whether they practice separation or assimilation, ethnic immigrants openly demonstrate the advantages of ethnic aggregation and nationalism. Nationalism gives them an eternal sense of peoplehood and cultural base. It also functions as an umbilical cord to their network of communities and their countries of origin. Asians and Hispanics open and operate businesses in their own enclaves. First, before they venture into another group's community. And of course, this isn't tarnishing Martin Luther King's Jr. legacy of integration, because integration is not the same thing as desegregation. Essentially, racial segregation is a systematic separation of people into racial or other ethnic groups um, in daily life by law. While desegregation is the process of ending that racial, seg uh, that racial segregation of two groups, usually um, referring to racism by law. But um, integration is... Um, Includes not only desegregation, which is the process of ending systematic racial, uh, racial segregation, but also employing and achieving goals such as leveling barriers to association, creating equal opportunity regardless of race, and developing of a culture that draws on diverse traditions, rather than merely bringing a racial minority into the majority culture. Desegregation is largely a legal matter, but integration is largely a social one. So before integration in the 1960s, Winston-Salem, North Carolina had a black city bus line, black theaters, black hotels, black restaurants, and of course, thriving black communities. But now all these are gone post-integration. And of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, he also um, stressed the importance of black businesses. He said, to the Negro community, the value of Negro businesses should not be underestimated. In the eternal life of Negro society, it provides a degree of stability. But at the same time, you'll probably overlook that quote by Martin Luther King Jr., but you're just going to just um, focus on integration. But you're not really going to um, always, you know, try to give us some funding for uh, black businesses. But you, but during the presidency of Donald Trump, you were very proud that Donald Trump um, oversaw the lowest black, black unemployment rate. But you never really talk about the black business rate skyrocketing under his presidency or anything of that matter but whatever
And of course, Dr. Amos Wilson on black blacks and job creators for others. He said, how many jobs do we create just by just buying from Koreans, buying from other ethnic groups out, out here? How many people are we creating employment for in terms of our spending and consumption habits as a people? We are creating all kinds of businesses, jobs, and wealth for others, and we must come to understand this. We are creating businesses and jobs for others while we don't develop businesses for ourselves and go around begging for jobs. And of course, Malcolm X on the black dollar drain. Um, and even when we try to spend money in our neighborhood where we live, usually because we haven't learned the importance of owning and operating businesses, the businesses of our community are usually controlled by outsiders. The source are controlled by people who don't even live in our community. So even when we try and spend our money in our neighborhood where we live, we're spending it with someone who puts it in a basket and takes it out as soon as the sun goes down. And of course, Carter G. Woodson on Black Economic Miseducation. In the School of Business Administration, Negroes are trained exclusively in the psychology of and economics of Wall Street and are therefore made to despise the opportunities to run ice wagons, push banana cars among their own people. Foreigners who have not studied economics but have studied Negroes take up these businesses and grow rich. So essentially what I'm trying to say is the civil rights movement should have stopped at equal protection under the law to stop the violence by racial whites against black communities during the Jim Crow era. The argument can also be made that prior to integration, we had more two, more two parent nuclear households than we do now, a sense of ethnic belonging in our own communities than we do now, meaning that we actually um, have more of a sense of belonging in our communities and we're proud to actually live in our communities more than we do now. We own more land than we do now. We have more businesses and we own more businesses and ran more businesses than we do now. And we also frequented our own people's businesses more than we do now. And the incarceration rate was probably lower in the past than it is now. And of course we have more homeschooling than we do now. And now we rely on the government to educate our youth. Uh, Dr. Claude Anderson said that empowering black children is more than teaching them math and reading skills. They must know how to uh, compete for wealth and power rather than poverty and acceptance, to, ra to produce rather than consume, and to be job producers rather than job seekers. The classroom education must be relevant to the real world outside of the school, and black children should learn more in classrooms than they do on the streets. In the South, members of the majority society burn black farmers' crops, poison our animals, pour kerosene on their farms' crops, and lynch at least one black man a day. Research studies in Norfolk, Virginia in 1995 and other school districts revealed that black children are not performing significantly better in integrated schools than they were in all black schools. Moreover, some schools show either no progress or in some, in or some instances, academic achievement gaps that were widening rather than closing. Integration has been used to justify closing black schools, firing black teachers and administrators, busing black children, assigning massive numbers of black children to special education classes, and in depriving black children of the advantage of being a majority population. Whites have control of black schools, whether they take over the public institutions or establish underfunded charter schools, a voucher system, or implement similar conservative concepts. So charter schools are underfunded and lack the support and ancillary services that they need to be successful. Blacks should collectively withhold payments of, of those taxes to support a school system that they cannot control um, locally. And Dr. Co and um, Dr. Claude Anderson also quotes Dr. Carter G. Woodson, wrote in the miseducation of the Negro. Blacks are the only group of people who take their most precious possessions, their children, and ask their oppressors to educate them and mold and shape their minds. Today, blacks are totally dependent upon the majority white society to prepare black children to compete, to compete with white children. White control of black schools presents a conflict of interest for the majority of white society whose primary interest is in its own children. And of course, conservative whites or right-wing white or right wing whites uh, political um, white ring uh, right wing whites uh, frequently complain that blacks are too race conscious well in fact their inappropriate behavior patterns indicated that they have not been race conscious enough when integration de uh, destroyed black business communities 
Um, black consumers commuted to white suburban malls and started spending approximately 95% of their annual disposable income outside of, their, outside of their communities. Black colleges were converted into major white colleges. Blacks seeking education, jobs, homes, and leadership were forced to turn to the majority white society. Black Americans mistakenly placed a higher value on individual achievement and merit as opposed to group achievement. We surrender our commutative advantages to group oriented immigrants who entered and dominate the black business arenas, uh, the black business areas, and outcompete blacks for jobs and educational and social opportunities. In our celebrity culture, the status assigned to popular blacks gives the illusion that blacks are judged and, and accepted based upon an individual achievement rather than accepting rather than the acceptability of the group and the community to which they cosmetically belong to. So yeah, um, again, after learning about all this from uh, Dr. Claude Anderson and Amoson Wilson and Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, the civil rights movement should have stopped the equal protection under the law. Uh, in order to stop the violence by uh, whites against black communities. Of course, Martin Luther King Jr. did lead the charge on integration, but of course, at the very end of, well, towards the end of his life, he did speak to um, Harry Belafonte. And, but Harry, Bear, Harry Belafonte said that um, Martin Luther King Jr. kind of did regret integrating us because we were um, integrating into a burning uh, building. That and, of course, all the things that I said about how integration actually did more harm than actually um, helped the black community in the United States of America. So, essentially, I believe in Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, Durham, North Carolina, Rosewood, Florida, Seneca Village, New York, Jackson Ward, Richmond, Virginia, and countless other self-sufficient black communities because they really did exist and they can do so again. And of course, the closest thing that we have to thriving black communities as of today are called um, black meccas. So essentially, a black mecca, no relation to the Saudi Arabian capital and the most holy um, site of Islam, is actually a city in the United States in which African Americans, uh, particularly singles, professionals, and middle class families are drawn to live due to some or all of the following factors. Superior economic opportunities for blacks, often as assessed by the presence of a large black upper middle class and an a upper um, class of black people. Black businesses and black political power in that city, leading black institutions in that city. Um, this, that, city's leading, that city is a leading role in black history, arts, f f uh, music, food, and other cultural aspects. And lastly, number five, harmonious black and white relations. In a city, and of course, that black mecca of today is the city of Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta has been referred to as a black mecca since the 1970s. Black enterprise also have referred to Houston as to become the next black mecca. So, in 1971, Ebony Magazine called Atlanta the black mecca of the South because blacks, because black folks have more, live better, and accomplish more, and deal with wise more effectively than they do anywhere else in the South or even in the North. Ebony also illustrated um, evidence of mega status as Atlantis um, have a high black home ownership rate. The Atlanta University Center, which is the nation's largest consortium of historically black colleges and universities. Atlanta was also um, the civil rights heritage because Martin Luther King Jr. He was born in Atlanta himself. Black business ownership, black owned restaurants and the civic leadership of the black clergy black fraternal organizations, black sorority organizations, and black political power in the city hall while it has acknowledged the poverty which a large percentage of black um, Atlanta's black population endured. And of course, in 1974, Atlanta became the first uh, major city, ma major southern city to elect, to elect an um, African-American uh, mayor. And then in 1983, Atlanta Magazine said um, Atlanta's reputation as a black mecca was deserved because it is true because the metro area now has the highest proportion of middle income African Americans of any city in the country. And then again in 1977, Ebony Magazine, a Ebony Magazine article illustrated Atlanta's status as the new mecca and the land of milk and honey for black people because a poll of the magazine's 100 most influential African Americans voted Atlanta overall the best city for blacks, possessed the most employment opportunities for blacks, it was America's most diverse city, and was the city with the best uh, schools and the most affordable housing for blacks. And then again in 2002, 
article of the same magazine reconfirmed Atlanta as the new black Mecca and the go-to city for blacks. And then again in 2009 by the Associated Press, 2015, um, another report showed that Atlanta had the greatest numerical gain for new black residents in any metropolitan area in the, in the United States. 2018, a Forbes magazine article ranked um, Atlanta tied for the number one city in, in the United States, along with the Washington, D.C. area for where African Americans are doing the best economically. And in 2019, a little bit more recent, and of course, well, 2018 is also recent, but 2019, also more recent, USA Today named Atlanta the nation's um, black te technological, te technology um, capital. Um, Atlanta attracts the most black professionals in the tech industry. And of course, um, as of 2020, which was last year, um, the Atlanta City Council remains a majority black, which is rare for city councils and major U.S. cities. Of course, Atlanta is also uh, the black entertainment mecca because in 2019, Tyler Perry opened his Tyler Perry Studios, which is the largest film production in the United, uh, the largest film production studio in the nation and the first major film production owned by an African American. And of course, in 2011, uh, the New York Times article with the short title Atlanta emerges as a black entertainment capital. Uh, comedian Cedric the Entertainer hosted the year's Soul Train Music Awards, said Atlanta has always been a black mecca and continues to be with one of the, with respect to um, the black musical talent in the city. And of course, with black entrepreneurship. Um, again, um, you know, uh, reading this book, well, the entrepreneurs probably didn't read this book, but again, um, with me reading this book, um, kind of, um, kind of do, uh, makes me want to move to Atlanta and then actually, you know, um, open up my firm there and then hire, uh, you know, black people and then I could probably target those, um, living in poverty and then actually help lift them out of poverty, uh, out of poverty and then, you know, make them, uh, more successful as they are. Anyway, um, according to a 2015 study by Nerd Wallet. The Atlanta area is home to 2.1 million black-owned businesses, which is the highest in the nation. Um, again, established in 2005, the Atlanta Black Chamber of Commerce is dedicated to supporting and connecting uh, black entrepreneurs in the uh, Atlanta area. So, you know, um, Atlanta is also the black uh, entrepreneurship hub. And, of course, I moved away from Atlanta for a bit and jumping into Houston as as. Uh, the magazine Black Enterprise alluded to. Um, Houston boasts an accomplished and strategically networked community for African-American entrepreneurs. Also, um, African-American entrepreneurs, African-American um, executives, and um, African-American business leaders as any country, well, any city in the country. Houston um, also claims one of the most robust and effective business development and advocacy organizations in the country. The Greater Houston Black Chamber of Commerce Founded in 1935 as Houston's first black civic organization is the go-to source for business development and strategic partnership opportunities, as well as education, capitals, and contracts for those entrepreneurs. And of course, um, it is worth noting that it was during the mayoral term of Lee Brown from 1998 to 2004, Houston's first African-American mayor, the city was named number one on the black entrepreneurship, on the black enterprise list of top cities for African-Americans to live, work, play, and edging out um, perennial black business, business meccas, including Atlanta, Harlem, and uh, New York, and Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And of course, um, 3204 Lions Avenue LLC offered the opportunity to invest in a cash flow and opportunity uh, portfolio of residential and commercial property on Lions Avenue in, F in Houston's historic Fifth Ward. And of course, that corridor was once a thriving black business district. Long term residents referred it to as the Block Wall Street of Houston, Texas. The founder and CEO of 3204 Lawrence Avenue, LLC, Christopher Senegal, has been a real estate investor and developer for over a decade. In 2013, he bought a block of partially abandoned drug-infested property and cleaned it up. Now he is building 14 new construction townhomes on that property. As a real estate um, social media influencer and advocate, he has successfully attracted young black professional buyers to be homeowners in the project. Houston has seen consistent population growth over the last decade, surpassing Chicago, Illinois. I mean, just like how I said earlier, you know, we yell, you know, Black Lives Matter, support black businesses, bank black, but 
none of us are really saying buy black for blacks but you know again we keep voting for these benign neglect politicians thinking that they would do right by us when in actuality they're not because they're just um so hard focused on that memo that um senator monaghan sent to uh president nixon monaghan being a democrat and nixon being a republican yeah at the same time we're being told that democrats are republicans um don't see eye to eye on many things but when it comes to benign neglect oh they see eye and eye easily so again you know politics politics for me like voting i don't really vote because they're still stuck on um benign neglect because of the benign, the benign neglect policy against african americans so since they keep um employing buying benign neglect um policies i'm just going to benign neglect their um, chances of winning office if they want my support then they're really gonna have to earn it and then if they really want to earn my support then they're really gonna have to stop with the benign neglect and actually um promote a black agenda or a black economic empowerment plan or push for reparations but if they're not doing that i'm not voting for them because voting is more of a quid pro quo you do for me and then i'll do for you so you know like that but again, essentially, um, again, just like how I alluded to earlier, imagine if that $1.5 trillion of black buying power this year is retained and then we let that money circulate in our community, meaning that we uh, buy from black-owned businesses and then we take that black-owned um, money, well, not black-owned, but that the black dollar from our black customers and then we reinvest it into our neighborhoods. And then again, how would our economic state would be? Will we be poorer if we actually do that? I highly doubt it. Will we be richer? I most, I most definitely think that we're actually going to be richer. And then, of course, if we're going to be more richer, then most of our problems are mostly going to be um, satisfied. I mean, you know, like the plan is, you know, we have our economics. Uh, we focus on our communities. We take that additional money that we, re that we retain, and then we start lobbying for um, politicians, just like all these super PACs do. Like, uh, like every single group have a super PAC, except for the African-American. Like the LGBT, they have their super PAC. Wall Street, they have their super PACs, but not the, um, uh, the African-American. So again, you know, money control politics, so we actually need money from economic base and then we're going to um, go up to the politics and then for the politics then we're actually going to go up to the court systems and then with the courts and the police then we can actually reverse the effects of the violent crime control um, law enforcement act of 1994 or the biden anti-crime bill of 1994 or the clinton anti-crime bill of 1994 and then you know in the war on drugs in all these private prisons and then we can actually more solidify having a black and a black economic empowerment plan just like how the asian american community they have their economic empowerment plan that's in full effect through executive order 13872 again signed by right-wing republican-leaning capitalist former president donald j trump and of course this is us picking ourselves up by the bootstraps that the right wing will want black people to do this is actually us using free market cap free free market laws for capitalism in a creative way to economically empower um, ourselves as black people. I mean, you know, the political right wing, they don't want to give us reparations, don't want to give us a black agenda, don't want to give us a black economic empowerment plan because racism, discrimination, um, tarnishing the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. But again, just like how I keep mentioning, you know, um, Former President Donald Donald J. Trump, a, a right wing leaning Republican capitalist, mind you, signed an Asian American Pacific Islander um, economic empowerment plan. But I didn't really hear you know Fox News um, criticizing um, Donald Trump on um, signing that executive order because socialism or big government or creeping socialism or uh, not using free market laws for capitalism to its full advantage. I mean, if you have um, found Fox News criticizing Donald Trump on Executive Order 13872 or the news media, because me personally, you know, went to YouTube, tried to find all these videos about it. I found nothing about Don about uh, President Donald Trump um, being criticized over Presidential Executive Order 13872. So again, if, if they really want us to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps, then we must practice ethno-aggregation, retain our trillion-dollar wealth, 
circulate it into our communities and then um, invest into our neighborhoods to um, strengthen our neighborhoods and then promote self-love more amongst ourselves and then we'll be successful that way. Because, you know, the Jewish American community, they do it all the time, the Asian American community, and these recent immigrant groups uh, do it all the time. And of course, uh, lastly, you know, we uh, mistakenly place a higher value on individualism and personal achievement and personal merit as opposed to group success. While the immigrant groups who actually come here, they actually place an emphasis on group achievement. So they place an emphasis on group achievement and all these immigrant groups, they're, you know, running businesses and, you know, buying up land and buying uh, buildings. Meanwhile, the black community, we're taught to stick with individualism. And now look at this from an economic standpoint. And of course, in our celebrity culture, the status assigned to popular blacks gives the illusion that blacks are judged and accepted based upon individual achievement rather than the acceptability of the group and the community to which they cosmetically belong to. So, yeah. Um, of course, and of course, um, I really do like this book because, you know, it's clearly written and it, um, you know, have um, 500 pages and seven parts and seven parts that have 22 chapters and all. So essentially, um, yeah, it's a really good book. And um, overall, um, if you want to venture to um, entrepreneurship or if my um, fellow black viewers um, reading this book and well, if my fellow black viewers actually want to um, jump to entrepreneurship, can't really recommend this book. Um, not enough. Well, I can't recommend this book um, a whole lot. Meaning, you know, I will recommend this book, but I just can't uh, recommend it enough because, you know, it's a really good book. Um, again, this is also Discussions. My name is Anthony Dawson Jr. And I will see you next time. So stay tuned for the next video.